Good morning. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? We're going to be talking about some pretty powerful and, frankly, some very uh, disturbing things this morning in the best sense of the word, things that disturb our souls and draw us to the living God, things that we need to confront, and things that God desires to bring to the surface. Would you join with me now in prayer? Let's ask that the Holy Spirit enlighten us and direct our thoughts in a manner that gives glory to God and brings about a renewed strength within. We join together. Dear Father, how we praise your name. We thank you that you are the Lord of the universe, that you are the God of all creation. And we rejoice that because you are God and because of your character, you care for each and every one of us. You know our deepest needs. And you know, you know, the desires and the yearnings of our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible mercy and your grace in Jesus, our Savior. And we thank you for the life-changing power that he brings to all who call upon him. This morning, O Lord, may we call upon your name. May we seek you while you may be found. And may we experience the joy of knowing you, serving you, and walking in step with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this morning's message gets right to the heart of the issue today. We're going to be talking about the R word. It is a word that has never been popular, but it is a word that is at the very heart of the scriptures, and it is a word that expresses the very heart of the living God. The R word, it's repent. This time of year, followers of Jesus all around the world are talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who prepared the way for Jesus' coming. John the Baptist has had hymns written about him. He is spoken of frequently this time of year. He is discussed and uh, mentioned in many settings where followers of Jesus get together. But sometimes in the midst of all of that, we lose sight of some things. John the Baptist was an incredibly popular individual, and yet he ended up being killed because of the R word, and he wasn't the only one. As you look through the scriptures, you see that word, repent, is a word that often generates a good deal of animosity, anger, and irritation, and it has always been true. For example, when you look in the Old Testament, an individual who was known for speaking words of repentance to God's people was a prophet by the name of Isaiah. According to the rabbis, he was finally placed inside a log and sawn in half. Another prophet known for proclaiming to God's people a message that said, come back to me, repent and return to me, was the prophet Jeremiah. He was thrown in jail and in a cistern, and was finally hauled out of the country by rebellious folks. John the Baptist came, announcing the word repent. And at first, many came out to him. But the religious people had a real problem with it, and in the end, John was beheaded. Repent. It's a word that generates a great deal of emotions and many responses. And yet it is a word that is used over and again in the Bible. This past week in preparing for this message, the Lord brought to mind, Chris, take a look in the scriptures at how many times that word repent is in the New Te- used in the New Testament, and then compare that with the number of times some other very powerful words are used. For instance, the word cross. Do you know how many times the word cross, the cross of Jesus is used in the New Testament scriptures? Grand total? 27 times, 27 times, but the word repentance is used 22, and the word, the verb repent, 34. There's a reason God speaks that word to his people, and it's not because he is angry and irritable and grouchy and grumpy, it's because he cares for us, and he always has. And that's what we see here in this powerful section of Scripture that we're going to be examining together this morning. Matthew chapter 3, 
verses 1 to 12. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn in them as we take a look once again at these powerful words of John the Baptist who prepared the way for the coming of Jesus. And as we dig into these words, I believe that what God is going to show us is a great deal of his plan and purpose for each and every one of us. He speaks these words because of his care and concern for you and me. And so we take a look, Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. We read the following, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you translate that literally, it can actually mean the kingdom of heaven has arrived. God's rule is coming down. And what God is saying in his word is that he desires to be the king of our lives. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is God's rule in you and in me. That is what Jesus came to bring. The kingdom of God. God reigning and ruling in our lives. You know, we human beings struggle with the issue of who's in control. And today, you see this in so many different ways. You see it among religious people and irreligious people. Religious people want to be in control. They want to control God. They want to keep God in a box. They want to make him comfortable and make sure that he doesn't get in the way of what they'd like to do. Irreligious people want to be in control. They want to control and guide and direct their own lives. They want to be in charge. Human nature is such that we long to be in control. And the message of John the Baptist was, God has arrived and he desires to be in control. And the issue he addresses for each of us is, who is in control in your life? John the Baptist came in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent, turn back to God, because the kingdom of heaven is near. The word that he used, repent, is a fascinating word. It occurs many times in the New Testament, as I already mentioned. But do you know it is a word that keeps coming up over and again in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament as well? The normal Hebrew word for repent is the word shuv. It means to turn around or to come back or to turn away from something evil. It is translated repent on a number of occasions in the Old Testament Scriptures, But more often than not, it's simply translated, turn back, come back to me, return to me, O house of Israel, God says. Do you know how many times that word shuv is used in the Old Testament? Blew me away when I looked it up this week. 1,053 times. Do you think there is something on God's heart? His heart is that people come back to him. His desire is that human beings return to the living God, not try to control him, not try to do things their own way, but rather let him rule. And that was the message John the Baptist proclaimed. He said, repent because the kingdom of God is near. God's rule has come. It is time to come back to him. Matthew goes on to describe what took place next. He says, this is he of whom it was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a belt of a leather belt around his waist. Pardon me for just a second. Oh, that is so much better. I can't see you at all now, but I can see this a whole lot better. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Have you ever thought about that? Do you realize this is one of the first examples we have in the New Testament scriptures of somebody eating fast food? I I mean, seriously. Locusts and wild honey. You don't have to raise them. You don't have to cultivate You don't have to do any work. It simply appears. Now, John had not experienced drive-through, but in the case of locusts, he had experienced (laughs) fly-by. That's what he ate. Locusts and wild honey. He lived simply, but his message was profound. Simple food, kosher food. 
but the message was life-changing. Here is what John went on to say. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. John recognized when religious people were coming to him that they often carried a great deal of baggage. And that is frequently the case. Very often, religious people boast about their own accomplishments and about how much they've done and how much they've done for God and how good they are. And they tend to walk with their noses held high, looking down on the rest of the world. John was not fooled by religious hypocrisy. When he saw them coming to him, he said, don't you begin to say that you have Abraham for your father. Don't tell me about your spiritual pedigree. Don't brag about the fact that you are a devout Jew and always have been and you're a descendant of so-and-so who is a descendant of so-and-so who is a descendant of so-and-so. John says, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Abraham was the father of all who believe. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham was a man who knew everything he had came from God. And John said that's the kind of heart that God desires, a heart that's humble before him, a heart that does not brag or boast except in the Lord God, a heart that truly does seek what is best for others as well as the heart of God. John says to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the others who were boasting about their spiritual backgrounds, he said, God can raise up from these stones children for Abraham. It was actually a play on words. The word for stones in Hebrew is the word abanim. The word for children, banim. God can raise from these abanim Banim for Abraham. God can raise from these stones real children of Abraham, real believers. Don't brag about your own personal experience. Don't brag about your own accomplishments. Turn to the Lord, John is saying. And he goes on. This is what we read here in these powerful words of Scripture. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Verse 10, the axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Today, when many people read those words, they say, whoa, that John the Baptist, he was one tough dude. What we sometimes miss is the message he proclaimed is just as relevant for today as it was 2,000 years ago. You know, when you compare the message of John the Baptist with the message of Jesus, you find some really striking similarities. And that's especially true here in the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to put up on the screen a few things that may shock you at first, but in the end will speak to your heart and my heart in some very powerful ways. When we compare and contrast John the Baptist and Jesus here, in the Gospel of Matthew, one thing that we see first off is that these two speak the same message. They really do, word for word. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. They're both saying the same thing. God desires to reign in a person's heart. 
John proclaimed that. So did Jesus. They were speaking from the same sermon notes. If you go on, you see something else. Here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, they give the same warning. John says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, and in Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus says the same thing. He speaks to religious people, those who are proud about their accomplishments, and he calls them, you brood of vipers. Let me tell you, when the living God speaks to you and describes you in terms of being a snake, you know this is not good. This is not good at all. And yet, that was the warning given by both John and Jesus. What he's saying is, when you live for yourself, when you try to be in charge of your own life, when you want to make sure that you are in control, you're actually coming under the control of the enemy rather than the living God. And rather than allowing people to simply go on that way without any warning, both John and Jesus called them out. You brood of vipers. You nest of snakes. I still remember as a teenager cutting the lawn back in Belleville, Illinois, where I grew up as a kid. I hated cutting the grass. Always did, but I had to do it. And so I was out there cutting the grass. And in southern Illinois, near St. Louis, summer is long, it's hot and it's humid, and the grass gets long and hot and, and really thick. And I can remember this one time being out in the backyard, cutting the grass, and I was cutting the, the great big backyard and hit a nest of snakes. Uh, what a mess. I will tell you, the, I, I have to admit, I thought it was kind of cool at the time, but you know, <laughs> it was a mess. That brood of snakes uh, that made the kind of thump, 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 thump noise in, in the, uh, the lawnmower and, and scattered out. It was the sort of thing that I looked at and thought, ugh. And then I thought, where's my kid sister? <laughs> it's not pleasant. It is not a pleasant term. Nest of snakes, brood of vipers. But what John and Jesus were saying is, this is serious. Don't take God lightly. And don't boast about your own accomplishments rather than allowing God to reign in your heart. They both gave the same warning. But there's something else. They both proclaim the same judgment. And it's very fascinating to look in the Gospel of Matthew and see John the Baptist and Jesus saying the same thing. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, our God does not say that because he is a mean God. To the contrary, everything you and I see in the scriptures tell us God is a good God. God cares for his children. God is concerned about people. God wants the best for his own. But make no mistake about it, God will not be played as a patsy. And that is what both John and Jesus proclaimed. They said, turn back. Turn back to God. And that's why that R word is so critical. Repent. Repent does not simply mean saying, oops, sorry about that, and then going on and doing what you always did before. Repent is life transforming. And that is what the scriptures have always said. In fact, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 18, we read these powerful words from that ancient prophet. God says, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. So, why that emphasis throughout the Bible? Repent. Turn back. Return to me. And the answer is because God cares. Because he cares about you and me and because we cannot do this on our own. You know, I can think at times in my life 
when my parents, my friends, my teachers gave me warnings. And they did that not because they were angry at me or because they didn't care for me. They did it because they were concerned for me. And that is precisely what motivates God. Repent and live, he says. And what he's doing is the very thing that John the Baptist did. He's calling people back to the living God. And when we hear those words, repent, return, turn back to me, those are words that summon each and every one of us into a new relationship with our God, a God who cares about us and cares about us deeply. I still remember reading a book many years ago written by a Lutheran pastor and professor, a convert to the the biblical faith by the name of John Warwick Montgomery. Today, Montgomery is in his 80s. He lives in London, England. But he penned a book several decades ago entitled Damned Through the Church. Quite a title, isn't it? Damned Through the Church. He said he originally wanted to title the book Going to Hell Through the Church, but the publisher wasn't real keen on that title. But what was at the heart of the book is what is at the heart of John and Jesus' proclamation. And that is, you can think yourself religious and still be far away from God. You can call yourself a good person, but still be far removed from the living creator of the universe. You can describe yourself as spiritual, but you can still be incredibly messed up in your relationship with God. And if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, whoa, let me tell you something else. You can be absolutely broken and devastated in your life and be closer to God than you ever imagined. Because you see what our God desires is hearts that understand how deeply we need him and how much we require what only he can give. When John the Baptist said repent, he wasn't simply beating up on people. He was calling people to the only one who can turn our lives around, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. John prepared the way for the coming of Jesus. John prepared the way so that people would recognize the Savior when he arrived. Jesus spoke the same words that John did because all of us have the same need. Each and every one of us, no matter how good, how delightful, how pleasant we are, how grumpy, how grungy, how difficult, how all of us have a need that only God can fill. And that's what Jesus came to do. And that was at the heart of John's message. He was calling people to repent because unless and until we see that we need a Savior, We are going to be lost either in selfishness and self-pride or in despair and deep sorrow. But what God offers is life transformation and joy and forgiveness and the power to begin all over again. And that is why the Lord Jesus came. We call him Jesus Christ Many people look at that and say, well, Jesus was his first name and Christ was his last name. That's not what we have here. Christ is a title, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one who would come to deliver all people. Jesus, the name literally means God is salvation. God is our salvation. And Jesus is the one who came to deliver that because he is God come into the human flesh. Everything we read about him in the scripture makes it very clear that the Messiah is divine. That God himself stepped into human history. And because God has come into our history, our lives can be redeemed and restored and renewed as well. And no matter what you or I may be going through in our lives, there is hope and there is healing in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope and healing in him because first of all, he is God. He is the one proclaimed by John the Baptist, by the ancient Hebrew prophets, by the angels at Christmas. 
God has come to earth and God has intervened. And when God comes down, you know this is serious. But you also know this is final and this is real. He has power because of who he is. He has power because of what he says. I find it so interesting as I read through the scriptures. I'm sure you have seen the same thing. Jesus spent so much time with people who were broken and hurting, people who were on the, uh, the fringe of society, who were often the outcasts, individuals who weren't always the, the most pleasant to be around, and certainly not the movers and the shakers. Jesus spent time with real people, and he had incredible care and concern for them. And the only ones he rebuked were those who were so full of themselves that they would not listen to his message of healing and forgiveness and new life. He has power because he is compassionate. What we see of him all through the scriptures is one who cares for individuals. If you're going through a tough time right now, if you're experiencing uncertainty and doubt and pain and sorrow in your life, you need to know that the Lord Jesus cares about you. He has always cared about you. There has never been a time when you did not matter to him. And he is able to deliver because he is so incredibly caring and compassionate. But ultimately... He is able to deliver, not just because of who he is and how he deals with us, but because of what he has done. And that is the heart of the Bible, that Jesus himself paid the penalty for our rebellion, for our sorrows, for our difficulties, for our pain. He willingly took all of the garbage the human race would throw at him. God himself allowed himself to go through the very pain that we go through and then to take the punishment that we ought to endure. Our Lord Jesus willingly went the road that led to the cross. And it's no accident that the word repent used in the Bible and repentance is used in large numbers because the cross is also used in large numbers. In the cross, we see God willingly subjecting himself to the punishment that you and I deserved and taking in his own body all of the pain and sorrow, all of the attacks of the enemy, and all, quite frankly, all that you and I deserve to pay because of our rebellion. And in Jesus, God took that for us. And that's why the scriptures say, come to him. Because you see, there is no other way. It's not a matter of, well, you choose your way, I'll choose my way, and as long as we're both going in a decent way, we're all on the same highway. It's one narrow road. And our God says, repent. Come back to me. And if you don't think that I care about you, all you have to do is look at my son and see what he went through and what he endured. If you don't think that God cares about you, then you look to the cross of Jesus and you see what he suffered for you and for me. And you look at him who willingly who did not have to do this, who could have simply called out loud and armies of angels would have come down, but who willingly took all of the punishment for us and bore it in his own body. And then you see one who has power, the power to forgive and redeem. Because the Jesus who is God and who is compassionate and who willingly endured the pain of the cross is also the Jesus who is now alive, who is risen from the grave and who is returning at the end of time. He is the Jesus who announces, I am coming soon, and calls all people back to himself. He is the Jesus who speaks to us and whatever may be going on in our lives. And he says, I have forgiven you through my shed blood. Come back to me. Repentance. Repentance means taking God seriously. 
It means understanding. I've blown it in my life. And the Lord Jesus Christ gave everything for me. Why would I not want to turn back to him? And when I return, when I hear his voice, when I listen to his cry, I realize how good he is and how gracious he is and what he offers and the way he can change lives and turn them around. He changes the hearts of individuals who are smug and self-satisfied. He changes us into people who are humble before God, who desire that others know about him, and who always seek to speak the truth. He changes hearts that are broken, and he brings healing and forgiveness and power and new joy because he is God and he is compassionate and he paid the price for you and for me. And he is alive and risen and returning. He is what Christmas is all about. And it's no accident that at this time of year, when people are getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus and saying, I want to be prepared for Christmas, what God is saying is, you need to be prepared for the final Christmas. When the Lord Jesus returns, when God himself shows up in the flesh, and when all people will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until that day, he is calling people everywhere, you and me and every other human being. He's calling us to repent, to turn back to him. It's not because he is ornery. It's because he cares. It's not because he is mean-spirited. It's because he is holy. And it's not because he just simply, well, he just simply wants to shake things up. It's because he wants to shake us and bring us back to him where there is hope and joy and peace. Knowing him is the greatest thing in all the world. Being in his word changes people's lives. I still remember as a 14-year-old reading the Bible for the first time on my own and being shocked by what I read. Shocked, first of all, at how much I needed a Savior. I thought of myself as a pretty good kid. I read the New Testament and I realized I was in the same boat with everybody else and I needed a rescuer. And that's who Jesus is. And that's why those who prepare the way for him do not hesitate to speak the R word. Repent. Turn around. Come back to God. Take him seriously in your life because he has so much to offer and so much to give. And without him, you can have everything and possess nothing. Without him, you can be filthy rich and absolutely poverty stricken because only in him is their life forever, for today, for tomorrow, and for eternity. And that's why John the Baptist didn't hesitate to say, repent. The kingdom of God has arrived. God is fulfilling what he promised. He is returning, and he is coming soon. Let's be ready for him, shall we? Amen. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Dear Father, how we thank you for your incredible goodness. Lord, not a single one of us can stand before you and brag about our accomplishments or boast about what we have done. But you love us so deeply that you actually came down and for that we give you heartfelt thanks. May we hear the words of John the Baptist, of our Lord Jesus of the scripture saying, repent. May each of us daily turn back to you. And in turning to you, may we see more and more clearly how good you are, how much you have given, and how much you can do. May the forgiveness that Jesus won through the blood of his cross and the empty tomb forever change each of us, that we may be your people, following your rule each day. Amen.
God bless you today. I pray that you have been strengthened and encouraged by what you have just viewed. The Bible is very clear. It says God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. His word has the power to change us from within. I pray that the ministry of Awake Us Now will have a life-changing impact upon you and those close to you. I would invite you too, if you have any special needs, if there are people in your life who are in need of prayer, or if you're going through some particularly difficult times, please do not hesitate to contact us at awakeusnow.com. There are people standing by who will be happy to assist you in any way possible. God bless you, and God keep you in His incredible care.